Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another session on green energy. Um, today, we're going to have Anthony Fulian, the CEO of Afriton Mining, continuing our green energy conversations. Um, we are moving on today from the South African issues we discussed under ESCOM last week to the opportunities and the supply chains for energy storage. Um, so Anthony, he comes from a geological her heritage in the Fuyun family, some of which are on the call with us today. Happy to have you all here. And he himself holds a bachelor's degree in business and agricultural economics from the University of KZN, which he then followed up with a postgrad diploma in finance, banking and investment management. Anthony has worked for the Deutsche Bank, Berkeley's Capital in London, and Reuter Capital Partners, a Pan-African Investment Bank. So he's got a broad experience in the banking world following all of that. And he is a founding member of the VM Investment Company established in 2006 to target opportunities in primary industries. VM's investments include MRT Group, which brought the, the NI MAG assets from coal of Africa, as well as gold exploration assets in East Africa. So, busy across the continents, it seems. Um, Anthony was also the founding director and CEO of Lima Resources, and he sits on the board of Bushveld Minerals, who's also got various um, energy transition narratives behind itself. So, but today, Anthony was speaking to us about the Namibian Reese Mine, um, which is well known for its tin resources, and at first is now making waves in the new energy conversation through lithium. So, but I will let Anthony give us the, the lay down of the lithium conversation and what you've been doing over in Namibia. So looking forward to hearing what you presented to us today. Thank you, Anthony, and over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nils. And uh, welcome everyone. And thanks for, uh, thanks for joining this morning. So uh, just a bit of, just to add a bit of background. So, uh, you know, we've, when we, when we first started VM Investment Company with, uh, with Richard and Morris and our, our business partner, uh, Fortune Majapello, uh, we took a view of, uh, of where we saw uh, you know, the, the development of mineral uh, uh, assets going. Um, so you know, in the sort of earlier parts of the 2000s, you, you saw a proliferation of iron ore and coal and uh, you know, you know, a, a lot of uh, Mining companies largely focused on the um, industrialization of China, but you know, moving on a sort of a generation from there, uh, the, the world is obviously uh, you know rapidly advancing, and uh, we've seen a shift. Uh, you know, everyone back then, uh, if, if you remember, in two thousand seven, used to talk about the the commodity super cycle and, and and what have you, and then it sort of petered off, and then everyone was like, well. Where, where to next? Uh, but what what we saw is that the commodity super cycle just moved into another gear and moved from from your industrialization minerals into uh, more of your sort of specialty uh, uh, metals. So so we when we started prospecting and looking at projects around the continent, we we took a view specifically of uh, of the specialty metals and metals that we believed would be key for the energy transition. And, um, and we, we did that, our, our first and our primary love has always been tin, as, as you can see here. Uh, but but we, we've also very successfully um, brought uh, vanadium in, into, the, into the limelight uh, with the vanadium redox flow batteries that, that will, will um, essentially be used to, to in bulk storage, and uh, uh, we uh, we floated a company called Bushveld Minerals that we took from an exploration company, and now produce about five percent of the world's vanadium, and are, are sort of at the, at the forefront of bringing uh, vanadium batteries uh, to uh, to the market. Uh, Fortune was supposed to be on here, but uh, unfortunately couldn't uh, couldn't join us today. Uh, but in 2017, we demerged uh, the tin assets off, off the back of the acquisition of, of the old Uis asset that I'll, I'll run you through today, but with a, with a, a view to, to sort of continuing the proliferation of uh, our prospecting work and prospecting and development work uh, in, into this new age, new battery uh, you, you know, transition that, that is obviously gathering a huge amount of, of momentum. So we looked all over the continent uh, for, for for various uh, opportunities and uh, and 
you, you know, uh, in Namibia, I think is 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 has been a largely forgotten province, and I think that in the next couple of years, uh, based largely off some of the initial work that we've done, as you'll see, uh, it it will become an increasingly prominent uh, uh, mineral province uh, for the new energy transition. So. Um, uh, just to give you a bit of a background, uh, so there, there might be a little bit of sales speak here, which is good because I'm sure you'll all go and buy some Everton shares after this. Uh, but you know what we've what we've uh, sort of uncovered is that not only was what was this um, the, this the, the tin largely uh, sort of forgotten, but the, the 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 mineral mix and the element mix within these pigmentites is is quite unique and and actually staggering uh, when you see the, the extent of it. Um, so, we, you know, we went, we went into production uh, we, and we, we uh, very early on, which is, which is quite uncommon these days. So uh, we fully permitted and, you know, the operations are, are really going from strength to strength. Um, coupled with that, we also, uh, you know, when we floated the company, we I, I bought a, a really uh, sort of, world-class team of, of uh, engineers on board that I've worked with over the years and geologists um, and coupled with a really prolific board of directors. I'm sure you'll remember, you'll know some names, obviously Lawrence and Terence, are very, very prolific uh, careers in geoscience, coupled with a guy like Mark Rawlinson, who's got a very, uh, a very uh, strong name in the, in the city as used to be head of Barclays uh, for resources. So, We've we've really got an, the asset. We've we've put together the team to develop it, and and we've got the the board of directors to kind of keep us in check a, a little bit. Um, but you, you know, it's it's probably worthwhile just talking a little bit about the fundamentals uh, of of the assets that that we've got and and of the 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 mineral elements. So I'll I'll talk a little bit about the uh, about the about the pigmentite in in a bit more detail, but but just to touch on the market. So, um, you know, tin has always been associated with, you know, tin, uh, tin cups and tin roofs and, and what have you, but uh, but the it's the it's increasing new uh, applications are absolutely vital for for the uh, for the new energy transition. In fact, they're calling tin the uh, the glue that holds the energy transition together. Um, so if you if you can imagine all of the uh, electronic equipment that we use and all the electronic vehicles, they run on on chips, and these chips are basically uh, made primarily now out, out of out of tin. So you know you'll read a lot about about the chip wars and the, the lack of semiconductors. So so you've got this whole new rebirth for tin uh, that's that's really leading the demand. But then uh, you, you know. You, uh, in the in the sort of mid mid nineties, all of the big mining houses uh, abandoned tin as as an element, and and so for the last sort of uh, thirty or forty years, you've had this this dearth of of exploration and and development of of tin assets. So so you've really reached this kind of unique pinch point with, within within the market uh, where you've got uh, this uh, this whole new burgeoning demand and you've got no new supply coming coming on stream so so the the fundamentals for a long term uh, tin price are, are incredibly robust and we, we don't see a lot of new projects coming on stream we've got our, our colleagues the alphaman guys in, in the drc you had a bit of tin coming out of myanmar for a while but you know nothing not, nothing of an industrial scale outside of that apart from ourselves so so it places us really, really well in in that market, and tantalum, you know, has a, has a similar uh, type of application with within new technology. So everything sort of really plays towards this whole new um, uh, new technology hypothesis. But the big sort of elephant in the room is really lithium, and uh, you know, the more that we're getting involved in the lithium space, the more blown away we are just in terms of the actual uh, lack of supply that's uh, that that is that is coming into the market so uh, if you if you look uh, your, your primary 
resources of lithium, as you all know, is, is typically your, your hard rock. Uh, you've got your sedimentary your clay deposits, and, and obviously the brines are, are probably the easiest and, and most well well known. So, so what what we're seeing now is the, the, that within the market, you've had all of these promises being made about this conversion into into uh, electric vehicles and and what have you, but what the politicians and and various uh, industrial uh, developers uh, like car manufacturers and OEMs and what have you, what they haven't really caught up with is is just where these this new lithium supply is going to come from. And I, 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 you know, the more we're getting stuck into this, the more blown away we are by, by just the, the the huge sort of di dis, uh, disconnect between what is actually out there and possibly coming on stream and what is going to be an, a, a gaping deficit within the next uh, within the next couple of, of decades. And there's no, there's no real substitute at this stage for that technology. So, you know, in order for a technology to, to become mainstream, you know, you, it, it obviously it has to go through a, a, a series of, de, uh, of developments uh, stage gates. And at this stage, there's there's no new technology on a mobile basis that, uh, as in, uh, you, you know, for for your vehicles, and and your electronic uh, applications that that can actually, uh, you know, step up to the plate. So we see lithium, uh, and you know, we we do joke about an office as literally it, it could be the new oil. Um, so, so. It, we're going to we obviously focus on the the, the hard rock uh, type of lithium because it's as unique as it is uh, from a market perspective. It's it's also very unique from a, a, a chemical perspective. So lithium, unlike tin, is is uh, it's it's actually more of a chemical rather than than a metal. And the 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 two prevailing types of concentrate that are typically used. Uh, it, it are your spodumene um, and and your petalite, and the, the the major difference, as you can see there, is is really boils down to the, the number of, of silica and and oxygen atoms associated with your with your concentrate. Um, uh, the the petalite typically is a very low in iron, um, and and has a, its traditional use in the glass and ceramics market, which is uh, and. As you can imagine, if, if you had a high iron content in your ceramics, it, it would obviously uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, create a brown tinge within those ceramics. But the the the, the big use of, of, for both of these uh, spodumene and petalite um, is is in the chemical market, which is where obviously your, your batteries are made from. So typically, what happens is. Uh, there's there's a roasting process, and I'll run through it in a bit more detail, um, at, where where you create a beta spodumene, and then that beta spodumene is then converted into a lithium hydroxide or a lithium carbonate, which which then goes goes into your battery production. Um, but then just to start touching a little bit on our project, so we in Namibia, uh, it's Namibia is really a hell of a destination to be. Uh, uh, to be, uh, you know, the uh, present in, um, you know, it's got a really good uh, logistics network. It is a mining uh, jurisdiction. It does have some of the biggest uranium uh, deposits on the planet there. So, you, you know, the, it's got a very skilled workforce. It's been voted recently as the second best um, uh, co country in Africa to invest in. Uh, you, you know, the, the, it's got a world-class mineral code, a very sound legal system. And, you know, the most important thing for us is it's also got a very strong mining cadaster system, uh, which, you know, is absolutely critical to the development of, um, of a mining industry, which is which South Africa could actually take, take a, a page out of that book. But a really great destination. Um, but the, the real beauty of, of Namibia, as uh, all the geologists on here will, will attest to, is, is it's all about the rocks. So, uh, and the, the pegmatite belts there are, are really absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, it's every time we, we bring a geologist out to site uh, and, you know, just run them through what we're looking at here, you, they get really very excited. So, 
So what, what the geology of the Iranga region typically consists of is these pegmatite belts. So, you know, typically your pegmatite belts run for a couple of hundred meters um, and are sort of tens of meters thick. Uh, but but typically uh, they all have have a relatively simple uh, 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 chemical composition uh, in in that they are intruded by a number of different elements, um, and typically these elements happen to be all of your uh, all of your your battery related elements. So you, you know what we're finding obviously is lithium, tin, tantalum, um, but the uniqueness of these belts in Namibia is that they they are incredibly thick. Uh, they're, they're in up to sort of two, 200, 300 meters thick in some places where we're operating, uh, and they extend for hundreds of kilometers. So, so basically from east to west, and then these belts sort of uh, uh, extend up up the coast, and typically, uh, uh, you know, as with all pigmentite belts, are intruded with a number of different uh, elements. So when we started looking there and started our prospecting work, uh, we focused specifically on the historic mining areas. So, um, you, you know, we were talking a little bit with Clyde earlier about the Tintan mine. It's, it, it, so you'll see the Nainas deposit. Uh, that's that's turning out to be a very interesting operation. Uh, the Brandberg West, uh, as you see in the in the top left there, which is a slightly different sort of uh, um, chemical composition to what we're dealing with uh, in the uh, Cape Cross Belt. But then the biggest of which was the old Uist tin mine that's that's you know no, been known for many years. It was an old Iskor asset mined for <clears throat> mined for many decades in, in the in the previous century. So so we focused our prospecting work on that. Um, but we we took a, we took a slightly different and and these days a controversial uh, uh, development path in that rather than mining on an Excel spreadsheet, we went around and kicked a few rocks together and actually restarted the, the old mine, um, which we've done very successfully. And, is, uh, and I'll, as I'll show you, is, is starting to make some good money. Um, but the, what we didn't ever anticipate and, what, and our, you know, just keep getting blown away was, is, is the, the, the sheer size of this, this ore body and what we're dealing with. So if you look on the right in that satellite inset, you can see uh, there are a number of uh, uh, historic pits. So what the old miners at ISCO used to do is they would, they would basically find where these pegmatites are cropping and they would, they would then go and test those pegmatites for mineralization and they would go and open up a pit. So they essentially mined over probably about 12 historic pits and, and that, that area there from is about eight kilometers and that entire area is probably about 44 square kilometers okay so so we went in there we set up the processing plant and we got we got throwing some rocks into the plant uh, but concurrent with that we, we also had the historic reserves so we went and and we started doing a confirmatory drilling program the biggest the biggest portion of that historic reserve was a v1 v2 pit so we so if you look in the middle a diagram I've, we've highlighted the leapfrog uh, sort of interpretation of 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 the historic information and the v1 v2 ore body was probably probably about 40 percent of the historic uh, reserves so we we did the confirmatory drilling program on that and concurrent with 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 the shallow resource and reserve we also did some down dip drilling because we we weren't sure why the, the ore body would just pinch off and what we found was that the, the ore body actually thickened and it was open-ended at, at depth. And that's, that's probably the, my, my favorite term in, in mining. So, so we, we were very fortuitous uh, in that the, on the V1, V2, uh, the, the ore body was in fact 70% uh, 70, 70 bigger than, than was historically declared. But you know, as as we all understood with, with pegmatites, we, we tested for a variety of different elements. And not only is the V1, V2 one of the biggest open cast tin deposits on the planet, it also associated with that is probably one of the biggest uh, lithium deposits on the planet. So, and that was just on the V1, V2 orbit. So we got very excited and we started uh, uh, converting all the other historic um, uh, uh, pits into, um, into dork sort of standards and, and put them all, all into leapfrog. 
and we actually found that the the entire resource probably uh, based just on historic terms is three times bigger so the v1 v2 on its own one of the biggest tin and lithium deposits on the planet it's probably three times bigger but then in our in our regional uh, uh surveys we, if you go back to the satellite image we found within our mining license area there's another 180 outcropping pegmatites all with visible tin and lithium mineralization. So, so this, what started off as, you, you know, let's get this old plant up and running is turning into what we believe will, will be a, 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 a tier one uh, mining deposit of global significance. And I, I use those words very, very lightly because they get, they often get overused in, in the, in the junior mining business, but as a as a prospector and a, and a junior mining CEO, you, you you literally probably only get one, maybe two of these deposits in your in your life, and we we really believe that this is probably probably the the, the best we'll get in our lifetime. So, as you can see, we 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 went and uh, you know what we find these days is uh, unlike what a lot of you guys would would be used to is you know a lot of people. Tend to go and mine on a on an Excel spreadsheet and come up with with great numbers and and then they they go and they they start uh, testing the ore body in a plant and and they find that the ore body doesn't do what it's what it's supposed to do on, on an Excel spreadsheet and and you know it's it's uh, it, it, my my late uncle always used to sort of emphasize the importance of ore body modeling and understanding understanding your ore body so. You, you know, it was off off the, that basis that we actually, you know, said, well, let's let's get get a good understanding of the ore body, and it's not only on the geology, but also on on the metallurgy, specific, specifically with these with these type of pegmatites. So so we built what what started off as a pilot plant is now probably one of the biggest tin plants uh, in in terms of throughput in the world, um, and that's thanks to my engineers getting a little bit. Uh, overzealous but but what it gives us is a strong platform not only within uh within this this mineral field but but within the region as as kind of almost the first mover advantage uh with within these pegmatites because we have managed to to really get get a couple of key assets that that are are, are really you know were historic mines but have the potential to to really uh, follow along along these routes, so uh, we, we've we've had a uh, we've actually gone through an an, ex, uh, an expansion phase. So uh, you, you know we we've we started off with like a thirty percent tin recovery. We're now getting close to seventy percent. We're increasing our throughput, um, and and what obviously the, the the most exciting part of about all of this is is uh, the expansion of our. Of our uh, lithium, so everything on the left there is pretty much what we've built in the last four, or five, five years now, um, and you can see the V1, V2 pit in the background. Uh, so what we're going to, do, what we're in the process of doing now is constructing the uh, the, uh, the lithium plant as a as just a pilot, and then we'll integrate those. And it, so just to put this in, into perspective, so if you look at that black circled region there, so that's the V1, V2. Ore body. Uh, everything in white, pretty much, is is your is your ore body. So it's literally like like coal mining. In in terms, of you get very little mining dilution. But but just to put that into perspective, so so that circled area is is if you go into uh, our our ore body model in the top left there, that shaded bit that that's the entirety of of our of our ore body. So. I mean, with the expansion, we'll probably be mining at a million tons uh, a year. So if you if you're talking about our target resource of 200 million tons, <laughs> it just kind of once again reemphasizes why this is such a, a, a historically important uh, ore body. So what we're wanting to do now is obviously ramp this up, uh, you know, drop that mine life and and uh, and and expand the plant quite dramatically once we've got to grips with the lithium and and uh, you know as i mentioned earlier lithium is it's not a it's not a simple uh process although it's quite abundant uh, throughout the throughout the world you know you you do get a, a lot of lithium deposits 
you know, you've got about 13 different types of, of lithium uh, elements uh, that, that and each and each of them have their own idiosyncrasies, if I can call it that. But um, it, you know, I'd like a, with a tin concentrate where you can sort of aggregate it and sell it all to one smelter. Uh, you you've got you, your your lithium concentrate needs to be very closely uh, or, or very or it needs to be very homogeneous, and you need a very consistent supply because it, it needs to be linked specifically to a, a conversion uh, uh, facility. So you can imagine if you've got too much uh, too much oxygen, for instance, in, in your concentrate, uh, and you put that into a into a, 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 a kiln. You're going to get you're going to get some pretty interesting fireworks. So so the whole trick to the lithium uh, uh, story is basically is is trying to get the the right chemical formula that's homogeneous enough that you can supply a consistent amount to a specific converter. So so what we're seeing is the Chinese are just absolutely dominating this conversion process. So they're going straight into the conversion uh, uh, side of things. And they are they're building converge, conversions uh, converters at, at a rate I've, I've never seen and at a scale I've never seen uh, in my life before. Um, and uh, but they they don't have the resource, so that's why you're seeing these Chinese really diving into uh, and paying these exorbitant amounts for for lithium deposits that they can then match up to the conversion. So you know when I, I was talking about this this sort of um, disconnect in the market uh, you know this is there really is going to need to be some a lot of work done uh, from the west and specifically the car manufacturers like in germany and uh, and uh, america to catch up to what the chinese are doing because right now the the, the geopolitical uh, uh angle to all of this is, is actually quite uh, quite amazing in that you know the 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 whole sort of Western uh, industrial complex around car manufacturing is pretty much being outsourced now to, to China because they're going to be totally reliant on China for batteries. So, so, the, so the, 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 that's where the opportunity lies, uh, I think. Uh, and, you know, Elon Musk and, and people like that uh, are, are, are really sort of um, uh, promoting lithium as, as the, the, the element of the future. But it's, as I said, it's, it's not that simple. So if you go further downstream, uh, you, you know you 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 can see the flow sheet here. Essentially, you you create a lithium sulfate, uh, so that's that's a potential product. But but the 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 real sort of uh, um, uh, 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 product that you're looking for here is, is carbonate, and uh, more recently that they uh, they're talking about a hydroxide. But but essentially, it all boils down to the purity of of that end product to go into into your batteries. Um, so just to just to put the the lithium market into perspective. So so despite everything you read, uh, there are uh, uh, and this is uh, this doesn't take the brands into account. But from a hard rock perspective, these these are the the lithium uh, projects in the world. You can see there's literally only about five uh, producing uh, operations there, and uh, the 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 one that's that's coming out to the fore, the, the newest green dot, which is why we've put it in, in yellow, will be will be the Uis mine, and the biggest of these of these hard rock deposits is in Australia. It's the old green bushes uh, deposit. It was in fact a, a tin mine. It is pigmentite hosted. Uh, it, it is a spodumene as opposed to a petalite, which is what we're dealing with. Uh, but uh, I do believe that as we continue our exploration and development, you will see that uh, the, um, uh, the the waste deposit will probably be one of the one of the biggest green dots on this uh, on this diagram, which which is why you know we emphasise that it is of global significance. So much so that uh, you know that the tin will almost be bypassed in the in the next uh, little while uh, once we get the lithium up and running. Uh, the, the so you're either going to end up uh, producing the tin for free or or the or, or the lith or the lithium for free, which would give your lithium a negative all in all in sustaining cost, which which is obviously uh, you know uh, very competitive in the world market. So. 
we will start off initially um, producing this uh, this product, uh, the pet light for the industrial market. Uh, we'll transition then uh, once we've linked up to a converter uh, it, for the for the battery market, and then obviously the down the downstream uh, uh, potential of a hydroxide or, or carbonate uh, comes into play, which is which is where the the scale of this deposit can be uh, truly exploited. Um, and as you can imagine, we've got just about every every sort of uh, Chinaman and and German and a trader and everybody wanting wanting a piece of this. So uh, you know, there's, there's, I'm sure in the future will be a lot of a lot of action going forward. Um, just to talk about some of our other deposits uh, as well, um, and just you know, just to highlight this read uh, why we believe this region is so important. So. The other license that we're looking at is Brandberg West, and I'm just going to jump back here just to show you where that is. Um, so Brandberg West, in the, in the top left there, in the in the Brandberg West belt, it was a historic gold fields asset, a very a very similar um, uh, sort of setup in in that it was open pit, but a slightly different uh, chemistry in that you've got tin, tungsten, copper, and actually a bit of gold associated with it. So we're looking at, at Brandberg West as our second operating asset, uh, and we'll probably follow a very similar development path. It's a, it's, it's a similar mineralization in that it's, in that it's vein hosted. So uh, you, you're gonna get, you're gonna see that you, uh, it's, it's, it's probably uh, it's slightly different process from a, a, a processing point of view in that, and something that will work really well here will be uh, ore sorting. So, uh, but what is really unique about this as well is, is the extent of that anomaly. So if you, if you look at the, if you look at those satellite inserts, you can see the, 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 the uh, black highlighted area is the historic pit. And then that, uh, that mineralization extends uh, sort of three or four kilometers. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, um, it's a really a prospective uh, deposit and something that, that that we believe will, will also be quite significant, probably not as significant as, well, definitely not as significant as WIS, but, but, but something are, are to look at for the future. And, and it just highlights, you know, for us, um, you, you know, despite, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, youngsters coming through and, and uh, you know, coming through with all sorts of new Explo exploration techniques, uh, you, you know, the, the work that was done by, you know, the, the previous generation like Richard and Morris and Lawrence and, mm -hmm. and John and uh, Mark Bristow and, you know, all the big names in, in, the, in the geology world, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of that sort of first principles uh, uh, work that's, that's required to identify these deposits has has largely sort of uh, gone gone amiss. Uh, you know, it's not to say that that there's a that there's a lot of a lot of great new technology out there, but you know, uh, getting youngsters out into the field and, and kicking rocks around and and you know marrying that up with with uh, processing capabilities and financing, you, you know, it's 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 very key to to make sure that that you know people take a different view or 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 a, or a more of a a traditional view in terms of how to develop uh, projects and and you know this this whole region is it's just mind-blowing that that people have kind of overlooked it for for so long and and specifically given the the uh, relevance that it's got to the the energy transition so uh you know it, it's it, it is something um that that we that we pride ourselves on but obviously given our heritage uh, that it's it's uh, something that's been ingrained with us for the last uh, nearly 50 years so you you you, you get to you, you get to uh indoctrinated with a certain way of doing things but you know it's it's it's, uh, it's not necessarily a, a bad a bad a bad thing these days so uh you know it's, it's also important um to emphasize what we're doing uh that that is different is that you know we're putting a strong emphasis on managing our environment social and governance you, you can't talk about being part of the energy transition and you don't have sound uh sound management philosophy around how you how you interact with your uh environment <coughs> excuse me and how you interact with your local communities so we, we we've we, we're putting a lot of work into how we how the, the entire sort of uh, chain 
is is environmentally sound. So we're looking at at uh, uh, you know renewable energy. We're looking at at sustainable uh, ways in which we we interact with our environment. Uh, you know the, what what people often forget, and you don't realize when uh, you know you, you kind of get wrapped up in the markets and everything like that is is the multiplier effect that that mining has on local communities. So, you know, what we've, uh, uh, you know, just since we've been there, uh, we, we noticed, obviously, when ISCOR left uh, the, the region, a lot of poverty uh, uh, crept into the local community and the multiplier effect of, of new economic activity there has, has, has been really quite visible and and something that, that, that we are incredibly proud of the work that that, that we're doing uh, on that. So, so it, you know, it's, it's very important to highlight that and and that that you, you know, mining needs to needs to evolve uh, together with this energy transition uh, because the two have the, the two have to work, uh, you, you know, together. Otherwise, you're not going to achieve the energy transition without uh, sustainable mining practices and. It's very important for us uh, as, as an organization and for me personally that uh, that we uh, we are trailblazers in terms of how mines are, are developed and and the way in, in which uh, mines interact with with the local uh, with the local population and and the local environment so something very, very close to close to uh, um, uh, our, our hearts and and something that needs to be focused on by all junior miners go, going forward. So that's uh, th that's the story of the of the UIS, uh, of the UIS deposit and the, the pegmatites uh, of the Irongo region. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully I've, I've taught you something that, that you don't know, although I doubt it, but uh, uh, you, you know, we, we uh, would love to hear your feedback and any questions that you might have. Excellent. Anthony, thank you very much. Great, yeah. it's great to see a few things starting to move in the sub-Saharan African continent, um, but very nice feedback on that. Um, I've got a list of questions to go through, but anyone else want to jump in with your, please put up your hand or, or unmute yourself and, and join into the conversation um, to kick this off. John, do you want to kick off with any questions from your side? Yeah, maybe just ask Anthony, what sort of money and round figures have you spent up until now to get all this on the go again? And and great effort and excellent presentation. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, I know, uh, John, we probably spent about uh, close on uh, 800 million rand uh, oh. out there. So, um, and we, we recently completed another, ra another round of financing of about a billion rand. Um, so, so that that will be used to bring the lithium and and continue the the, the expansion. Okay, and, and is that with lo is that shareholder money and and local bank? I see you've done some bank financing as well. Yes, yeah. So, so essentially shareholders. So we we've we've been very lucky to attract some uh, some really high quality institutional money out of London. Mm -hmm. uh, we. Uh, we've also got Standard Bank uh, Namibia or Standard Bank South Africa as, as our partners, and the Development Bank of Namibia are also coming coming uh, on board. And then uh, a big chunk of, of capital is coming from Orion Mining Finance. That that it's a, it's a royalty uh, fund. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, obviously my pet hobby horse. You know, when you look at what's going on in Namibia and Botswana and all around us. You know, there's yep. absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be seeing similar things in South Africa. You know, we've got a pegmatite belt that's untapped up in Namaquiland, and, and I'm being a bit parochial. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, you mentioned that they've got a, a very um, functional cadastre system like Botswana. The sort of you know, standard thing that we should have have here, you know, made in, made in Pinelands, Cape Town. Uh, John, uh, you know, and uh, look, We've operated here, you, you know. I mean, you remember those Zyplot days, and yeah. have you, and dealing with, you know, it's it's actually staggering how corrupt it's the system has become. Uh, you know, and uh, not having a cadaster system uh, suits suits that, unfortunately. Uh, you know, and it's, it's something that the Namibians have got right. In fact, they're taking the step further now, having all uh, all applications directly online 
so 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 you know there's no fudging of, of uh, paperwork or, or what have you so it, uh, and we we are we're contributing to to that development uh, in collaboration with the minister of mines so it's it's, it's you know they're, they're new that they are very aware of of their standing and are, are very jealous to protect that no, no, fantastic. And, and you know, the sort of money you're talking about, which, you know, I guess I'm just putting it in the band mid-tier, you know, equally look at the at, at the senior end and you see the type of investment that the beers have done in the ocean there with their, I think it's now seven, you know, big mining vessels. I mean, it's huge. And, you know, we don't see any of that in South Africa. Yeah, and, and then anyway, you know, yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it is, and you've got Total and Shell with the big oil discoveries. Uh, you know, you've got Rosh Pina, you've got the uranium mines. So, it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot, and there's a, a mad rush. You know, we've got Chinese guys almost artisanally mining lithium around us. It's, it's bizarre. It's, it's quite something. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Henny, I see you've got your hand up, and then I'll run through some of the chat questions. Yeah, just uh, you mentioned that the all body is open ended. Does the same go for the life of mine. Henny, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you, you know, if, if you want to talk a bit of geology, uh, 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 you know, I'm probably not not the best, uh, and my old man will probably attest to that. But uh, but you know, when we when you sit with with Lawrence uh, and and we discuss discuss the, the this all body. It's it's almost as if uh, there's there's kind of like a a big mother load and and uh, once again it's a it's a favorite term of of geologists to talk about the mother load but but what we're finding amongst all of these pegmatites is that is that the grade is incredibly uniform so you, you know like you, it, you, you, it may be point one or point zero two percent here and there that it that it varies but it, it's just the the uh, distribution of of these of these cassiterite crystals throughout the ore body and and the the as as a result that the lithium um, crystals throughout the ore bodies is is incredibly consistent throughout all of these uh, these different um, uh, belts and what is interesting here so if you see uh, that B one C one triangle so that's that's just south of of uh, where where we are so so. Uh, where we are, uh, where we're currently mining, is you're getting this, this really rich uh, pit-like crystals, and then as you go further, uh, further south, um, you, you into B1, C1, you're actually getting spodumene. So uh, I, I see the, the I see Mark Cronwright on here, so I better just check what I'm, I'm saying here. Uh, but but um, it's, it's what, what we what we what we anticipating this is some sort of geothermal gradient uh, the further south you go and so so that you know just to find out where 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 the source of, of all these pegmatites comes from is, is something that that is probably best uh, discussed over a few beers at the campfire thank you thanks i think that michael conrad says all good so well done um <laughs> So yeah, Andy Clay's, one, one of Andy Clay's questions was looking at, you know, what are you doing to, with regard to sampling to raise the confidence and stability of the grades? You've kind of started to, to talk about that a little bit now regarding the, the uniformity that you're seeing. Yeah. Obviously, from a geology perspective of, of trying to understand pegmatites, which in itself is an ongoing study, and I'm sure there are b debates between pegmatites researchers around the world. Um, so to see uniformity is probably not something that is commonplace. I don't know, maybe any, anything else you wanted to add to that for Andy's question? Yeah, so, so, so Andy, look, the, the, the thing is like, when, you, when you're drilling these pegmatites, you, you know, it's, it's very difficult to kind of get that grade distribution um, it, because it's almost like a nuggety effect with these crystals. So, so you either got to drill uh, really, you know, uh, uh, big, big uh, diameter holes, or or you got to bulk sample um, and and to try and understand that variability within the ore body is is you know the best way of doing that is through a bulk uh, test facility. So the technology. So we are in the process of setting up a bulk test work facility. Um, that's it. Well, it is turning out to be a lot bigger than what I, I'd initially expect the, the engineers to do, but 
but uh, you, you know, it, you you need to run campaigns through different parts of the ore body to understand the variability in terms of those uh, the, the sort of uh, pockets of nuggety or this nuggety effect uh, with with both the, the the tin and and the lithium. So so we 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 are busy building a, a lithium pilot plant, but also as part of that test work we. We we're going to be running uh, some test work on uh, ore sorting and the the work that we've done already in the in the laboratories uh, are on ore sorting. We, we've used the Steinit uh, ore sorter. You, you actually you, you it's it's amazing technology. And I think it, it will be um, more widespread in, in the next couple of years. But but you, you're actually getting rid of about eighty percent of your waste upfront. Um, and and you up, you upgrading your feed grade in, into your plant by about uh, two to three sometimes even four times so 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 the, so those two aspects of, of running that bulk uh, test work campaign and then uh, doing some more work on that ore sorting is is work where we're hoping to get uh, just a little bit more um, uh, you know color around around how to uh, really get most of these pavement tiles. Anthony, it's Andy here. So I hear what you say, but um, one of the problems that I see is that with pegmatites, you get large crystal sizes. And when you talked about the drilling, you'll, you'll either hit a, a crystal or you don't hit a crystal. And, and one of the, the, the approaches that you're talking about with regards to bulk sampling, I wholly endorse it. The problem is that when you're trying to get these things signed off, to let's say some form of jaw compliance, this yeah. sampling becomes a nightmare because they're 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 fixated on a twenty five meters uh, uh, you know regularized grid spacing, and and trying to put that into context is very very difficult with pegmatites. So, um, your your process of bulk sampling and campaigning the ore as you go to estimate a block relative to what you produce is great, but. I just don't see how the regulators allow this to, to, to go through, to be honest. I don't know whether anybody else has got any comments. Yeah, so, uh, luckily I've got I've got our competent person online here, so he can explain that a little bit better. But but Andy, no, to your point, uh, look, I 100% agree with you, but and that is why we've taken the approach that we've, that, that we've taken, because if if we were to go and, and do a, and done a feasibility study on this, okay, uh, and and you know, we we went to told everyone, oh, we're going to be mining a, a point, and, and and I know that I, I know you actually did the the original CPR, I think, Andy, on this uh, at Deloitte uh, with uh, um, many years ago. To, um, I'll deny all knowledge. Eh? I'll deny all knowledge. Okay. <laughs> anyway. But but it looks so. So what you uh, like the 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 only way you can prove this. Is by actually getting into production. Like there's no, there's no long short of it. Uh, you know, unless you, unless you sort of, uh, as I as I like to say, digging holes and selling dirt, it's no one's going to believe that that you you could you could do this. And and the problem, as I as I alluded to earlier, is in, in the mining business, it's a lot about perception. So you know, like everyone when we started out there, everyone's like, ah, oh, low grade. Uh, mentality is not going to work, uh, you know. Anthony, Anthony, sorry to interrupt you, but I think you've got a fantastic opportunity to take the lead in this yep. process. You've got such a vast number of opportunities. And if you create the sampling methodology where you link what you see in the pegmatite, let's say through drilling, relative yep. to what you do in bulk sampling, I think that should set a precedent and go for it. I highly endorse what you're doing. Uh, and Andy, just, just to add there, Andy, it's got to be easier than alluvial diamond deposits, and you seem to get uh, that one. That's what you told us. I'm not going to say any more, John. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, if I could just chip in, if I may. Yeah, sure, I, it doesn't seem to be a hand-raising facility for some reason. Um, uh, if I recall correctly, the oist pegmatites are, are not particularly zoned. I might have that wrong but they unusually unzoned, if I could put it that way. And so they, uh, uh, they, to my recollection, they don't have areas with very large crystal growth. It all seems to be fairly 
similar in size with scattered uh, cassiterite and 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 tantalum minerals etc and in that context it's uh, it's probably uh, a better situation than trying to evaluate what I would call a zone pegmatite with very large crystals of interest. Uh, is it, can you comment on that? Is that is that the case from my memory, yeah. or am I, have I got it wrong? I, I see I see Mark's hands up, and uh, hopefully he can uh, get me out of jail here. But uh, he's he's done a lot of work, obviously, on this. Thanks, Mark. You're, you're on mute there, but. Yeah, Mike, can you unmute yourself? No, now you're muted. Unmuted. Oh. Slow on mute. No, like no. Yeah. Right, well, Mike, I'll give you I'll give you a sec to to figure out your your um, sound and see if you can get that out. In the meantime, I, I want to just jump across to a quick other question also that came out, you know, and you started talking about the interest from the, from the Asian side of the world in, in lithium, obviously where that's where all of the growth and demand is really sort of driving this whole narrative at the moment. Yeah. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about geopolitics and sort of how that's driving raw material demand and supply chains as different impacts here, right? We've got, um, Governments getting involved, as you've mentioned, from the US, the EU coming up with strategies and, and supply chain diversification away from China. And a lot of, a lot of those are starting to restrict um, any involvement with Chinese supply chains. So I think one of the questions that, that I've been posing, and, and not just relating not to lithium or tin for that, is for how do the opportunities in Africa approach this, right? Because Africa as a continent is sitting in this position where you know there are good Sino-African relations and effectively in every direction. And I think there are a lot of opportunities on this continent, given the political landscape happening in the northern half of, of the planet. So I thought, you know, what what is what is your feeling on that landscape? And you know, you mentioned your map, you showed you know every direction opening up to that. Is is that the approach or are you focusing in on a certain jurisdiction to get sort of an ESG cr credential support from, let's say, the, the more Western side of the demand? Yeah, look, uh, Nils, that's a, that's a good good point. Uh, um, so the, 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 the first sort of takeaway is, is on sustainable development of, of, of these deposits and, and, you know, moving away from kind of almost a resource nationalism, but, mm. you, but, but coming up with with a responsible and sustainable approach to exploiting the, the, these minerals because unfortunately you, you know as, as is often the case you, you know the the, the 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 systems that are in place are very uh, open towards uh, uh, corruption okay and uh, and I'll use the example of of Zimbabwe for instance okay so, so Zim obviously had a torrid time in terms of developing their their, their minerals and you know uh, uh, corruption was it was absolutely endemic but you know that they've kind of gone through that and they've almost evolved uh, uh, well they have evolved now into a much more responsible way in terms of dealing with their with their minerals and and, and I think if it, there is a realization that you can't um that, that you can't uh actually you know realize value without having a responsible mineral development yeah. Absolutely. so 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 it's it's i think it, it 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 is going to start taking hold uh i think south africa still got a, some way to go to get through this the slump but but it, it you know the the i think that there is a, a growing realization amongst amongst sort of less developed countries that that this needs to be de developed sustainably but at the same time, you also need uh, institutions, global institutions, to to assist. Uh, you, you know, so uh, you know the, the the difference is. Uh, so I'll give you just a little bit of an anecdote. So we had a site visit, and we had a Chinese crowd there that, that came out to to in the morning, and they, you know, the, the guy was like, uh, "I'll buy this." You know, just flat out, "What, what do you what do you want? I'll, I'll buy this." And I said, "Look, but it's not not really for sale." And then uh, the afternoon we we had uh, we had uh, and I mean the numbers were eye watching, and then the, the afternoon you had 
you had the Germans there um, that were, was like a German de delegation looking to invest in 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 African projects. And uh, you know, we said, well, you know, what's your timeline? And they said, well, we'll have a workshop uh, when we get back, and uh, you know, the process will probably take two years. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. you know, the the, the the you need like there, there needs to be a mind shift amongst Europeans. I think they've become too, and, and I'm not not you know sig signaling out any any group in particular, but I'm talking about industrial uh, developers. I, uh, I'm talking North America and and Europe because they they are the ones that are leading this uh, transition to to green technology, and uh, all their vehicles want to go electric. They they're going to have to step up and really take an active role in in developing the institutions so that these things can be developed in a sustainable manner. So it's it's, it's going to have to be a real sort of uh, introspective look from a geopolitical point of view, way above my pay grade, uh, to to actually get get this all right. Yeah. No, I mean it's. I think that this makes some points, Anthony. And it's it's a it's a complex scenario, right? Where you've got sort of a policy-driven situation becoming a consumer-driven one, but it's obviously not wanting to pay more at the same time. So there's there's various stages that the whole you know planet as a society needs to go through. But I think you know just to summarize what you're saying, I think you know in the short term the market is in Asia, um, and you know if European and and US want to support projects while they don't yet have the demand, they need to realize that in order to fund a lot of this is through China. Um, yeah. And I mean, case in point is Rare Earths Mountain Pass in the USA, um, exporting everything to China right in the middle of, you know, the, the trade war that came out in 2017-18, right? It's, it needs to be funded in order to get up. Now they're hopefully in that place to make a move. But yeah, yeah. it's very interesting or complicated conversation in there. Um, but you know, in my opinion, it leads to a lot of opportunities in Africa, and I think Africa has 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 a chance here to step up and service all all parts of the geopolitical agendas effectively. Um, Michael, I see he says sorry, so I guess he hasn't managed to get his sound to work. So Anthony, if you want to have a go at um, Clyde's comments on on the, um, yeah, so on the I think my sound is working. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. Now. Speak up, Michael. <laughs> okay. No, what, what I was saying is Clyde is right. Um, just in terms of the pegmatites being poorly zoned, they you, you get the zoned pegmatites in Namibia, and we seems to be one of the unzoned ones. So it does make the assessment of the lithium dis mineralization quite a lot easier. Um, obviously, you've got big crystals of material there, but from one hole to the next, you're not seeing too much variability and no more so than you see in any of the other pigment in terms of what you see in the spodumene bearing pigmatites. So yeah, it, it is a it's not as complicated as say one of those zoned pigmatites you get around Karabib. And the mineralogy is pretty simple as well. So what Andy was saying, it does go hand in hand with test work. Um, like any of our clients, it's sort of one of the things that needs to happen right at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. I know there's a couple studies. There's a group at the University of Stellenbosch. They're looking at sort of sampling techniques to see yeah, whether you can sort of do selective sampling at a certain scale to, to measure that out. So I know there's a group at studies working on that as well at the moment. Um, any, any other questions out there? I don't see any new ones at the moment, but while, while that's happening, I've got one more for you, Anthony. I've, uh, while, while you were talking, I got in touch with my lithium analyst to ask him if he's got any questions for you. Um, and, and he said, you know, sort of, you know, with the whole lithium supply chain narrative that you presented quite nicely here, there's also shifts in the intermediates, right? You already so, showed yourself there's two different intermediates leading into battery grade that goes into batteries. Um, now that's really looking at at the, the uh, lithium ion, the NMC battery cathode, uh, cathode materials. Now, yeah. when you're looking at the LFPs, so the lithium iron phosphates, that's starting to look slightly different um, in that supply chain. And yeah, so his his question to you was, you know, is Africa looking 
at well looking at that as an option to get into because based on our forecast that's going to become quite a significant part of, of the future for the lithium industry yeah absolutely so look what you what you get is uh, you know as i've mentioned uh in my presentation just uh, i'll just go back to that slide so uh uh yeah here. Yeah. So, so look. I mean, you've got you, you've got your traditional spodumene, you've got your petalite, um, but then then you you've got a, a, like your a, your your lepidolite and uh, obligonite and every other art you can kind of think of. Um, there's about fourteen different uh, lithium uh, lithium uh, minerals basically, and uh, the the uh, as as your as this sort of boom in, in lithium is is occurring. Uh, I think what you're going to see is a lot more uh, um, uh, sort of IP developed around processing the, these these different types of of, uh, of technology. I mean, the, the Aussies, as as the only the Aussies could say, you know, it's it's not it's not lithium unless it's spodumene, you know, uh, pretty much. And and uh, you know, I think that 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 narrative is is going to change quite dramatically. I mean, already. So what 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 we were seeing from green bushes, for instance, is that they were actually using spodumene uh, and selling that into the into the glass uh, into the glass manufacturing. So the, the all the low iron spodumene they were they were selling into glass manufacturing, but that's totally been taken out the market now. So so I, I think that that this this sort of absolute boom with within the lithium uh, uh, space is going to see. Uh, Sort of non-traditional forms of lithium being being used more towards your chemical grade uh, battery battery form of of, of lithium. So it 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 is. I, th I think there is going to be a shift there. Um, so, I mean, just in terms of spodumene to to petalite, you know, the only difference really is is your is your is your extra silicon and, and oxygen. So. All, all that really needs to happen, uh, and, and lower grade of lithium, obviously. But all that really needs to happen is you just need to roast it at, at a, a hundred degrees uh, centigrade high temperature, and you still end up with it with the beta spodumenes. Or you're obviously going to create more waste because because you're getting rid of the, the silicon oxygen. But uh, you, you know, I, I, I do believe that that you're going to start seeing a, a lot more. Uh, a lot more diversity around the different uh, types of, of lithium being used for, being used in batteries. Not great, thanks. Sir. Can can I pop in a request as yep. opposed to a comment to a question? Yeah. Uh, so, so Anthony, I want to be part of a delegation, yourself, yep. myself, a couple of others, to the Namibian government. Yes. To propose that Namibia becomes the first country in the world to be a hundred percent renewable energy based primarily on wind, solar, and storage with a dash of water from Ruakana. Uh, we can do it in three years. It would stop all those people saying, Show me a country in the world where there's a hundred percent renewable energy. Are you in? <laughs> Funny enough, Claude, I was actually in Vintuk yesterday and I was meeting with these guys that that are looking to do this green hydrogen uh, uh, sort of story. I, I, and I must profess, I don't, I don't know. What you, so, so you know, it's got all the right elements. Exactly as you said, you, you've got the wind, you've got solar, you've got, uh, and, and what we're looking at now is, is desalination water that I think is going to be key to unlocking all of this. And, yes. and you have the whole, you have the whole chain. So, you know, you, you start uh, the, the, the whole, um, What's it? Code uh, three compliance. Sorry about mine. You probably, uh, you know, in terms of the whole value chain being mm. totally green energy. And look, uh, it's it's. Uh, I've got a I've got a very close with the minister, and you know, he keeps saying, "Well, you got to build batteries uh, here in, in Namibia." And I keep saying, "Well, cut your cut some of the red tape in terms of in terms of permitting, and uh, we can, we can." We can really put this on the map. So, you know, it is that's, that's already on their radar. It's something that that I, I think that that they will be very receptive to to looking at. So, and, cool. and so, Let's Anthony, it. It. Like what happened to the gas? Are you going to sell that to South Africa, the Western Cape? No, you leave the gas in the hole. I'm afraid it's time has passed. 
Yeah, we should you probably find you've got some dissenting, you know, views <laughs> on that as well. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Right. We... This is Steve Haggerty. May I make a comment, uh, Ros, yeah. and a question? Please. So the I, I was wondering whether um, you had any uh, basic geochemists uh, uh, in on the on the sampling process, and I, you know, I listened very carefully to what uh, Andy had to say. And it's really interesting that um, on the periodic table, for example, lithium is three, and tin is fifty. So there, in and of itself, is a really interesting dichotomy of two elements of very different ilk coming together in, 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 in a pegmatite. And yeah. uh, so I, I graduated from the Royal School of Mines. We did our, uh, had some primary mining experience in Cornwall. So my question, uh, Anthony, really great talk once again, is the, is the Cornish tin um, pegmatite uh, granite area likely to see a resurgence? In, in the British economy? Look, I don't like sort of commenting on other guys' projects, but uh, <laughs> I th yeah. Uh, okay, so, so it's, it's, I get asked that question a lot, obviously, because we list in London and, and, and it's, it's quite topical. So the, the issue with the, the Cornish mines, first and foremost, is that, that, that they're mostly that need to be dewatered so uh, before they go and do any confirmatory uh, drilling on that. But as we've seen with, uh, you, you know, that they've tried that with uh, Tungsten West. Uh, it was uh, the old yeah. Wolf, uh, Wolf Minerals project. They've tried that twice uh, to get that into production. The, the, the problem in Europe is too expensive. There's, you know, we've, we, we've I've, I've put a lot of emphasis on managing our unit cost of production. Uh, you know, it, we, we, uh, it really is uh, next to ESG, the, 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 the topic in the office that we speak about the most. I don't believe that you'll be able to get your unit costs down uh, low enough to be able to, to bring those into production. The, the underground, uh, it's, it's, you know, some of it's like literally under the sea. So, you, you know, a lot of your, your mining is going to really be pretty new age and in if you're going to get get to that level of of mining uh, you, you're going to have to have a very high incentive price of tin to warrant that that development i, I just you know the costs of power you know the, the cost of you know uh diesel everything is just like on a scale of literally 10 10 times what we're dealing with so so i'd, I'd like it there's it's not to say that that's not prospective. Really, pretty interesting, uh, and you know, I, I know the guys all very well. Uh, it's interesting geology, interesting concept. I just, you, you know, it's very few people actually get mines into production these days, and I become very cynical, unfortunately, as a result of building a mine from scratch. That what people put into their their Excel spreadsheets is is very different to what actually happens uh, when you when you go and. Uh, and, and take rocks out the ground. So it's it's I I I, I would like to see it. it I, I think the the world needs it, and I think England needs uh, needs those uh, deposits to come on stream. But I think that uh, I, I, I I don't think that they'll be able to get the the right uh, economies of, of uh, in, in terms of being able to get that uh, up and running successfully. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Maybe they must just stick to Cornish pasties. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there's, there, there are a lot of lithium projects spread across the world. So, I mean, I think a lot of the conversation also talks into the longevity of these brine deposits. Again, you know, we've got these ESG conversations around there. It's not just true for lithium. You've got the nickel mining in Indonesia and... Some, some ESG concerns are, you know, they're, they're not unknown across the industry, but they're not yet sort of at the forefront on, on the OEM side of cutting out certain parts of the supply chain. You know, and cobalt has been sort of a key and leading example with regards to out of the DLC and the issues around that. Um, so, yeah, lots, there's lots of conversations around, around, you know, which projects move ahead and ESG and 
you know, as you say, ultimately costs, you know, to, to meet to the markets as, as much as you want to diversify. That's part of it. So yeah, really appreciate yeah. all your thoughts on all of that. Um, yeah, any any other questions? I think we've, we've had yeah. a long session. Yes, yeah, so any last words from you, Anthony? And then uh, I it's good. Uh, it's Andrea's sorry, the brick factory is still operational in Guis, uh, and uh, you know we have every now and then a little run in with our with our neighbours there, but it's 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 all good. Um, that we coexist quite nicely there. But you know, uh, no, thanks everybody for for hosting us um, and letting us tell the story. Uh, I know that Fortune sends his apologies because we were going to sort of uh, do a joint uh, uh, lithium and vanadium uh, discussion. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's always great to be able to tell people what we're doing and, and where we're going. Um, hopefully you found what I've said of interest. Thanks, Anthony. Now you're invited to next Thursday's talk where Charles Mustard is going to, you're going to be the first one to ask him how he's going to power your mind for you. Uh, but, um, so let's, let's roll this thing into, you know, let's, let's design it from there. So yeah. you're all invited to next week's talk where we're going to find out to, how to power your mind. Okay. All right. Thanks, Anthony. That was excellent. Most appreciated. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anthony. Cheers. Thank you all. Appreciate your time. Bye. Thanks, Annie.